All right. Now the last two, which are, I think, um, they're, it seems like it's going to be difficult, but they're actually not because they're so different from each other. I think the two that are most confusing, honestly, sometimes can be the two proportion ones because you have to really read carefully. Are they talking about one group or two groups? But these ones, for the same token, one group is this one. This middle one that I'm about to do is really special. It, it works like nothing else, and it's the matched pairs one. So it's when you're trying to do the difference in matched pairs. So you're trying to find the mean of the matched pairs differences. And that really is a unique circumstance. So let me give that one its own thing. So this is the mean of the matched pairs differences. This is the only thing we do with a dependent sample. And for me, this semester, it's on page 279. It might not be there for you, but it should be kind of around there. This was section 11.2. Your hypothesis is that the mean of the differences is zero. That's my dog. She just shook it. All right. Now, the normal part actually doesn't change. It's the same as it was before. So it's given graph or n greater than or equal to 30. Like that part still is the same, right? Those are the same for these two. But the trick is that you're going to be given a data table with differences, right? So you're going to be given a matched pairs data table. And that's kind of a unique thing. So um, I'm just going to say, if you're given a dependent sample... right? It's going to be really obvious, right? So if you're going to see um, a matched pairs data table, matched pairs data table, that's this one. And remember what a matched pairs data table looks like. It's going to have a pre and a post or, you know, a before and an after, <laughs> or, or it could be like a husband and a wife because they're a dependent sample. So if you see a matched pairs data table, that's this one. It's, so it actually becomes kind of unique, right? Now, technology wise, that's also kind of unique. This is the only time we do this. This is stat T stat paired because these are matched pairs. So you're assuming that you have this, this paired up thing. So this is stat T stat paired. A very unique thing. Now, if you're on a TI 84, again, don't bother if, if you don't care, but it's a TI 84. It's actually the same as this, the T test, but it's the T test on the difference column. Differences. And that's key. You're looking for those differences for that matched pairs table, and you work from that. All right, now the last one is its own thing as well. It is the one for independent means. So the mean difference, well, it's not really different. So this one's the difference in two groups. And this one is the difference in the means, right? Catch the difference? I said difference too many times. Okay, this one's about the difference in the group, right? So you take one group, take before and after, before and after, and then look at the mean of those differences, okay? This one is about two separate groups. How do their means differ? How do their means compare? Get it? So this one is about um, the difference in two separate groups means. So difference in two means, which is not the same thing. Sorry, I got to pull up my camera. It's not the same thing as this. This is about the mean of the matched pairs, right? So you find those differences and find the mean of it. This is, you find the two groups and then you check their differences out, right? They're, they kind of work backwards from each other. So this is the difference of two means. And these will be for separate groups. So this is going to be section 11.3. And then null and alternative, we just saw it. It's mu1 equals mu2. You always assume that the two groups have an equal mean unless you can prove it otherwise. And you're going to look for the same thing you were looking for up here. The mean, the average, the standard deviation, right? So mean, average, standard deviations. It'll have two of them given though. So I should say means 
averages, standard deviations, it'll have two because it's for two groups. Or I could give you a data table, but all of it for two separate groups. And that's the key. This one right here is going to give you one table with two rows that are related to each other, right? Before and after, pre and post. This one's going to have two separate groups that have nothing to do with each other, right? So one table and another table, and they don't have anything to do with each other. That's this one. All right. Now for normal, um, again, I could give it to you. I'd have to give you two graphs, right? Can't just do one, two graphs, or... I'd have to have N1 bigger than 30 and N2 bigger than 30. Oh, that might be a little crammed in there, but hopefully it works. Right? So N2 bigger than 30 is what that's supposed to be. Here. Let me do it this way. There we go. That's a little better. Okay. But if I'm going to do graphs, I'm going to give you two of them because they're two separate groups. So, in fact, let me kind of make that more obvious. Two graphs given or two graphs or, right? N1 is bigger than 30 and N2 is bigger than 30. And all of that is right on the exam notes packet if you look at it. It mentions it right here. Graphs, graphs plural, right? Graphs plural because there's two of them as opposed to this previous section where I said graph singular, right? Because that's really about the differences. It's not really about the two separate groups. But this one for section 11.3 is about two separate distinct groups. So they're going to have to give you two different graphs or two different sample sizes. Okay. All right. Now, technology-wise, what well, was right there on that page? It's stat, t stat, just like the ones above, right? Stat, t stat for all three of these. They go to stat, t stat. This one was one sample. Oh, I forgot to highlight that. This one was one sample. This one's paired because it's talking about matched pairs. This one's two groups. So guess where you're going? Two sample. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so you're going to two sample right here because that's two groups. And then from there, you'll have to choose data or summary um, just depending on what you've got, right? If you have two big data tables, one for each group, then you'll do data. If you have a giant paragraph with all sorts of stuff written, then you'll do summary. You'll do whichever one you've got. All right. What are some other words that cue a hypothesis test? Just to kind of note this. So here, this is a little bit of a review, but we're going to say it again. So if you see level of significance, let me do it this way, level of significance anywhere in the problem, that's going to be one of these generally. Right. So if they're talking about, you know, significance or level of significance, right, can you conclude that, right, conclusion implies a hypothesis test. Okay. Um, then the relationship between alpha and beta. Remember that alpha and beta have an inverse relationship. right? When one goes up, the other goes down and vice versa, right? Alpha is the probability of a type one error. Beta is the probability of a type two error. This is the probability of a false positive in a screening test. And this is the probability of a false negative in a screening test. Usually when we do that, we're thinking of medical tests, but of course it can be other types of tests as well. For example, airport security tests. That's a screening test when you go through the metal detector. All right, um, another review. Remember that statistical significance, all that means is that you get to reject H naught. And we reject H naught when our p-value is less than our alpha. Practical significance is a judgment call that you have to make based on the context of the problem.
right? You kind of have to compare the sample values to the assumptions made and figure out whether you think the difference that's called, by the way, not a parenthesis, judgment call based on the context. So you have to compare um, the proportions. Uh, um, let me say this, compare the statistics to real life situations and figure out, you know, well, statistics to, how about this, to that null hypothesis. Let's just leave it at that. And you have to say, hey, did these sample statistics, right, things from our sample, that's what a statistic is. Did our sample statistics, even if they didn't rise, or if, even if they rose to statistical significance, was that really a big enough difference to be practical? That's a judgment call. That's a harder thing to do. Last but not least, let's never, never forget what a p-value is. A p-value is the probability of getting your sample values, your sample statistic, um, which whatever those might be, right? So whatever your sample values were, your sample proportions, your sample means, etc., by random chance, if H0 was true. So you assume H0 was true, then what's the chance of getting what you got by accident, right? By just random happenstance. That's what p-values are. P-value, p stands for probability. It's the probability that you're going to get what you got by accident, by random chance, right? When the p-value is low, we reject H0 because you reject H0 when your p-value is less than alpha. So if your p-value is low, reject the H0, the null hypothesis, right? So we always want p-values to be low. The lower, the better. Low p-values are what you're looking for. You want something that's not a fluke. And if the probability of a fluke is low enough, you're going to reject that it's a fluke and say, nope, I don't think it's a fluke. I think my null hypothesis was wrong. I think my assumption that I was making was wrong. That's the whole point of everything we're doing in hypothesis testing. Is your probability of a fluke low enough that you don't think it's happening, right? If you don't think it's a fluke, your only other option is that the null hypothesis is wrong. Or technically that the sample was biased, but we don't play that way because we're not in an advanced statistics class. So we're not going to deal with sampling bias, but that's the other option. Those three options should sound familiar to you because we covered them in chapter eight. Sampling bias, fluke, right, fluke, or the null hypothesis was wrong right? The parameters that we assumed were wrong. Those are basically our only options. All right. I hope that helps when you put it all together for chapter 11.